heroes are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them, from the larger-than-life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen to the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. The doctor saving lives at your local hospital. The war veteran down the street who risked his lives for our freedom. The police officers and firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur. The creator. The producer. The ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. And I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks of the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello, and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is uh, Richard Matthews, and I am on the line with Andrew Alleman. Uh, Andrew, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Awesome. Glad to have you here. Um, so let me do a quick introduction for those of you who may not know who Andrew is. Um, Andrew is the founder of podcastguests.com, a service that connects podcasters with guests for their own shows. Over uh, 15,000 people use the service, including The Hero Show. Um, so you created the service because you were looking for more guests for your podcast about domain names. Um, and your domain industry trade publications, Domain Name Wire, was founded in 2010. It's been cited by the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and NPR. So with that brief introduction, why don't you tell us a little bit, Andrew, what is your business about now? Why do people come to you? Um, and you know, what's the, the basic service you, you provide? Yeah, so I, I think you summed it up nicely. So Podcast Guest is a service. It, it connects podcasters like you with guests that are looking to be on shows like yours. And so I have over 15,000 people using it. Every week I send out an email that has a list of podcasts that are looking for guests. And you can look through there. And if there's one that's a fit for you, you click a link and apply to be on the show. And then there's also the reverse element, which is I have a, a number of experts in different fields that want to be a guest on shows. And so they can uh, be featured in that service so that podcasters can find them. Um, it's been around, gosh, what, three, four years now when I started it. And as you mentioned, I... I created it because I had a problem of my own, which was I was looking for more podcasts for, for my show and couldn't find an EP, yeah. easy, simple, and, and inexpensive service to do that. Yeah, and just for, uh, for those of you who might be curious if the service works, when we put out our first invite for our show, we uh, booked our show out for a year. Wow. Um, That's great. So That's great to hear. It's it's a very effective service, so I appreciate uh, you existing um, and us having a chance to get connected. So let's start off um, with your origin story, right? Every, every hero has their origin stories where you started to realize that, you know, you were different. Maybe you had superpowers and maybe you could use them to help other people. Um, where you started to develop and discover, you know, the value you could bring. Um, and maybe that's uh, for you, like when you got started on this entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial journey, was podcast guest your first venture or, you know, what sort of kicked off this whole being an entrepreneur? journey for you i've all ever since college go back to i've done little entrepreneurial things but in in college i, I really kind of kicked those off and was doing various online businesses uh you know this was the late 90s so as the dot-com boom was in full swing but it was kind of hard as an individual to create even a website back then um, but I did create and sell a couple of websites, uh, nothing that made me rich, but really got the bug into me. And I registered a lot of domain names back then as well. Um, and so I kind of say that's the start of my online entrepreneurial journey. Uh, and since then, I've, I've always had something going. You know, I did go into the workforce after college, worked for other companies, uh, but I haven't worked for really for another company in a, in a long time now, right? And it's all been about doing these yeah. online businesses, harnessing the power of the internet to, to connect people. Um, and that you mentioned domain name wire and open. So actually it was 2005 when I created that. And, and at the time I created it, it was basically a blog or a trade publication for the domain name industry. So people that buy and sell domains, companies like GoDaddy, uh, governments, lawyers, that sort of thing. Everyone that's part of this kind of ecosystem. 
And at, at the time I started it as a hobby and then it turned into a business. It's, a, it's obviously a niche publication, but it gets 100 to 150,000 page views a month now, which is pretty good for, for what the domain name industry is. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's turned into really a, a business for me. And it's where I make most of my, my income from. And then Podcast Guests has been layered onto that over the past few years. Um, so the uh, the news publication, what is the uh, monetization strategy in that business? So that's all sponsor based. And so I have a number of companies, 10 to 15 at a time that are sponsoring it and, and just have ads on the site. You know, when I started it, uh, the advertising models changed a lot since when I started it. Um, but I'm grateful to have a number of sponsors and advertisers that are trying to reach my audience that have some of them have been advertising for over a decade now uh, continuously. And so that helps that, that business thrive um, without, uh, without the ups and downs of, you know, chasing ad dollars. Uh, obviously there are ups and downs in that in all businesses, yeah. but it, it, it makes it easy for me to focus on, on creating great content and not having to worry about chasing chasing page views and, and clicks and that sort of thing. So I'm I'm curious. Um, one of the things we've just, we've discussed a number of different business types on the show before, but we haven't ever discussed a business where um, you are essentially creating content to create to get eyeballs, and then the eyeballs you are selling to your advertisers, right? So your clients would be the advertisers, um, mm -hmm. and I'm just curious how you how you think through a business like that when um, when you have to create content like good enough content for the people who are reading. Like, do you consider the, your readers customers as well as your advertisers? How do you just work through that in your head in terms of what you're putting together and how you're structuring the business? Yeah, absolutely. You know, my content is geared a hundred percent toward my typical readers. Um, you know, I'm not thinking about the advertisers when I create that content. At the same time. Um, you know, they're all part of the industry, right? So they understand my audience. And so it was kind of, uh, in my case, I got the audience first and then the advertisers came. I think very early on, I, I used Google AdSense as a way to, to generate a little bit of money. Uh, but then I had companies come to me and say, hey, we like what you're doing. Can we put a banner on your page? And uh, of course I said, yes. <laughs> and so it's kind of worked out yeah, from I there. Yes to money. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, the fortunate thing has been since the early days, uh, I haven't really had to ask. It's been more, you know, you put a, a sponsor or an advertising link on the website, put together a media kit that uh, is, is there for people, you know, they can reach out and I send them the media kit and they can advertise on the site. So it's never been something I've really had to sell, but I count myself very fortunate and I understand that's not the case. Yeah. With, with with everyone, you know, my timing was great, uh, and 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 I think I, I put a good product out there too. The domain name industry is fairly small, so there are only so many potential advertisers, and the audience is, as I mentioned, somewhat limited. It's kind of a, a niche, which which is good. You know, if I were to create, would have created a blog about technology back then. There were already a lot of competitors, right? There there were no blogs yeah. covering the the domain name business. So um, one of the other things I'm curious is in that monetization model, you are generally um, paid or you charge by via impression. Is that correct? Like number no, of views? No, so, so that's something that I've done that I'm really happy about is I just charge a flat fee per month. And so if I get a lot more page views than usual in a month, that's great for advertisers. If I, if I miss, if it's not a great month, then it doesn't hurt me. Uh, as long as I have a good, uh, you know, good continuous stream, you know, I, if, if I'm down a lot for a long time, then obviously that will impact me because the advertisers won't get the results that they're looking for. But yeah, they're looking for. when you sell ads by impression, which I understand you kind of have to do in some circumstances, kind of like selling podcast ads by the, by the listener, it's, it's, it's a really tough game. Uh, and I think that it creates incentives for you to, do things that do not benefit your audience, that do not benefit your typical reader. You yeah. know, chasing page views, writing things that might get a lot of traffic, but it's not 
something that your audience will really care about and your advertisers won't benefit from that audience. So I've been very fortunate to be able to do kind of this sponsor model that is, of course, they want to know how much traffic I get, but it's not, if I get 150,000 page views one month and 100 the next, it's not going to change the income I, I make from advertising. Yeah, and I think it, uh, um, it's one of the, I want you to call it the flaws of having an impression-based, you know, our, our whole internet is free because we're selling attention and, mm -hmm. you know, the, that leads to clickbait problems, right? Because the yes. incentive is not to create good journalism. The incentive is to create things that get clicked on and drive impressions. That That's absolutely right. And, you know, and there's been kind of a race to bottom there. So there have been ad blockers, which breaks that model of free content in return for, for viewing ads uh, yeah. and, and a lot of things around those those issues that have come up. So I think the but but you hit the nail on the head there, the, the clickbait, um, trying to get people to the site and not delivering on what they're looking for. Those are all problems that come with that that uh, impression based or click based advertising. Um, so do you, do you see trend in the industry is moving more towards like your type of model for content, either where the advertisers are sponsoring it or when, or consumers are paying for the content? I think we're seeing a lot of kind of the sponsor content and people trying to hide the fact that something's sponsored. And so, uh, that, w which has been a challenge. A lot of that's been brought on by ad blockers though, as you know, these companies, especially a media publication at has dozens or, or even hundreds of reporters, they, they need to make money. And so I, I think we're seeing two trends. One is a push more toward the subscription-based model for online access. And so, you know, it used to be you could get the stuff for free, you know, view the content for free in return for viewing the ads. Now we're seeing more and more sites that charge for the access, which is a good model if they deliver great content. It's very difficult though for a small publisher to do that. You know, it's easier for someone like Wall Street Journal yeah, or the New York public. Times. Very difficult for an individual blogger like me to, to do that model. So I've just been, I think direct ad sales have always been better than ad networks in, in, in most cases. And so I've been very fortunate to be able to do that. And then the, the commitment that my sponsors are making is fairly small each month too. Uh, so it's not um, it's not breaking their bank either way. You know, it's a fairly small commitment to, to most of them, and so that has helped also kind of keep this this flat fee uh, approach work. That's really awesome. So let me move on a little bit from sort of like your origin story and your business model and whatnot. And talk a little bit about personally your superpowers that you bring to the business. Right? What is it that you do or build or offer this world that really helps solves problems for people? you know, things you used to slay this world's villains, so to speak. Um, so just, I, I'm curious in terms of like, what is it that you think you bring to either podcast guests or your, um, the domain name publishing business that have made them stand out? Sure. I think, I think on the podcast side, so we can start there. The, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I had this problem, right? I was podcasting and I had done about 50 interviews. Uh, most podcasts are kind of like this. It's in a Q&A or, or interview format. And I realized that I kind of gone through my Rolodex. My podcast was about domain names. I'd you know, interviewed 50 or so people that I knew from the domain name industry. And I, and I was looking for more. And I looked out there and saw that the, the market for finding guests for a podcast, for getting people booked on there, there are services out there. They're very much, they aren't platforms, they're agency models. And you have to pay quite a bit of money, you know, especially if you're just starting out $400, $500 a month uh, to either find people for your show or to get booked on other shows. And I knew that I couldn't be the only one having this problem. And so I think one of my superpowers, if you will, will be kind of figuring out how to put tools together to, to make things work. And as a solo operator, to do that with very little upfront investment. And so I, I realized that there were a lot of free online tools I could use, free or inexpensive, to put this together and see if it worked. So really, I needed a, a MailChimp account 
to to send out this weekly newsletter and I needed a basically a, a way to collect these applications for for people so it started out very modest with using Google Forms which I actually still use to this day uh, and a, a website podcast guest to to find those new users and and Mailchimp and so I sent out the first newsletter. I, I really had to, I reached out to people individually, said, this is what I'm trying to do. Do you want to participate? And my first newsletter went out to about 150 people. And it featured, I don't remember how many podcasts, maybe five or so. But even then, the podcast got five, 10, 15 applications from other people that wanted to be on their show. Uh, and so I realized this was working. That's really cool. Yeah, it, it was. It was very exciting for me. And at that point, you know, I put I put in some elbow grease. I'd spent some uh, some time on it, but you know, Mailchimp's not expensive. Google Forms is free, and so it was kind of finding out how to get these these pieces together. And I I modeled it off of a service called Help a Reporter Out, or people call it Haro in the industry, which connects. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that before. Yeah, it's like let's say you're a Wall Street Journal reporter. And you want to write about people going, uh, you know, that have had problems with their mortgage and they were able to work it out, right? Well, it's not easy to just pick up the phone and call and find people like that. So they'll put out a request on Haro for that and people will, will respond. And so it's kind of the same idea here, right? If I'm featuring your, your podcast, you go in and you say, this is what I'm looking for. And then there are a lot of people that want to get on podcasts and, and they can respond to that. So creating the community has been fun. Uh, another thing I'd say is a superpower is um, kind of the incremental. So I did the minimum viable product, got this out there, it worked. And then I listened to my audience, if you will, the people that were using it to figure out what they needed. And that in turn made ways for me to make money off of the service so I could continue to, to grow it at, you know, at this point, I've invested quite a bit of money into it, but it's been basically all money that's come in through the through the service as well. Yeah, and I think that's the, that's a really important point too. Is when you build something new, is really listening to the user base and directing it to to you know solve their problems. And mm -hmm. one of the things we talk about regularly on this show is that the uh, the businesses that succeed the most are generally the ones that they don't. They don't bring a product to a market. They find a market that has a problem and they solve it, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which you know seems like it might be here, neither here nor there. But it's really an important distinction where you're because when you when you're working to solve markets problems, then you you'll build and grow and scale your product and continue to meet their needs, and it continues to grow. Right, and and the you, what you're doing can change. Uh, I I just read a, a new book by Mark Randolph, who is one of the uh, co-founders of Netflix, um, and it's it's called That Will Never Work, and it's it's about the the launch of Netflix. And his original idea was to to rent videos via the mail, like VHS, because DVDs really they were very niche at the point. It cost over a thousand dollars to buy a DVD player when he launched the business. Yeah, yeah, I remember that as a kid. Yeah, ninety eight, and so. Um, and then, you know, it talks about how the business morphed and, and they were actually selling DVDs at the beginning and 97% of their revenue was coming from, from selling DVDs rather than renting them. And, and now look, it's something where, uh, you know, I, I don't even, they might still ship DVDs, but I mean, everyone just, it's streaming, right? And so the, the business changes and you kind of figure it out as it goes by listening, listening to your audience, which is something that companies like Blockbuster didn't do effectively. They didn't see these, these changing, yeah. these changing trends. And now there's, there's one Blockbuster store left. Is there really, there's still one left? Yeah, there's a, there, um, there used to be one or two in Alaska. I believe it's in Oregon. Maybe it's closed down now actually. Uh, cause, cause I keep, you know, once a year they're like, Oh, this Blockbuster closed, but it was usually in remote areas where you couldn't get good internet to stream. Um, so certain areas of Alaska, for example, yeah, that makes there, sense. There we go. But the company is long. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's crazy too because they were a powerhouse in the '90s. I remember growing up, it was you know, mom, can we go down to the Blockbuster and pick out a game or a DVD or whatever and some snacks and come back home? Right. And that's how we hung out after school. Yep. Yeah. So 
Let me uh, move move on a little bit and start the other the other side of your superpower is your fatal flaw, right? You know, just like Superman has his kryptonite or Batman's not actually a superhero. Something that you have struggled with in growing your businesses over the years that uh, that you've you've worked on, and I guess more importantly, what have you done to help sort of overcome that for people who might run into the same kind of issues in their entrepreneurial career? Yeah, I, I would I would say there are a couple things that I struggle with um, to to this day. Really, uh, one of those that I think a lot of people face is self doubt, and that is questioning if your idea is actually going to work. And, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's hard to put both feet in when you're like, oh, this could be a failure and, and to worry about failing too. Uh, and so there, there are a couple of things I've done to deal with that. First of all, most businesses fail, right? And a lot of people that have had a successful business yeah. have had many that fail as well. Um, and so I, I think the more you learn about those, those circumstances and the more you look at things like Facebook and Netflix and Google that were successful and realized they're really an anomaly and that the founders had yeah. a, a lot of luck, you know, reading this Netflix book. I mean, this company, Netflix could have shut down on many occasions. I mean, they were really uh, lots of struggles that they faced and they had some, some good fortune that, that made it work for them. Uh, and so realizing that failure is just part of business and getting past that, I think, is, is very helpful for overcoming self-doubt. And another thing you can do is, is test, right? And, and that's what I've done with podcast guests. You know, I didn't put 20 grand in it to start. You know, it was, hey, let me figure out a way to do this for $1,000 and get it off the ground and, and, and see if it works. So, um, but I, I think that's something that a, a lot of people deal with throughout their life, especially entrepreneurs. And it's, it's a constant struggle. It's something that as I've gotten older, I have greater perspective and it's helped with that, but it, it's still, still a challenge. Um, I think even people that outwardly suggest that they don't have any self-doubt, um, I think internally yeah. a, a, a lot of them do. So uh, another challenge that I've had is juggling multiple things. So I have a, I have podcastguest.com. I have domain name wire. They both demand attention on a weekly basis, if not daily. And so moving between those, I, I also sell ads for my wife's uh, podcast and, and such. And so shifting between those is, is, is difficult. And there are a lot of tools out there now that make that easier. Google or, or Gmail makes it easy to get all your mail into one box and separate it and do that sort of thing. At the same time though, that creates kind of some of that constant fidgeting between one to the other to the other. And, and that's a lot of work. And so I think people that can do one thing and do it well, that, that's a smart approach to take. I've never been able to do that, but a lot of times I think that's why little projects that I launch fail is that I don't dedicate enough time to them to see them and, and get them off the ground. So I, I think a lot of that depends on your personality, but I do have a, a challenge where I'm moving from one thing to the next. And I think as a result, that's still something that uh, causes me to struggle getting businesses to where they need to be. Yeah, and I, that's one of the things that uh, that comes up regularly is, you know, um, we we est underestimate how much work it takes to get something going, right? And mm -hmm. we think we'll be a lot farther along in a year than we are. Um, realize, right. like, but how, how much of a difference you could take if you actually really dedicated a decade to doing something, right? Then you, right. you can create much more sustainable businesses and how much effort it actually takes to put into something, right? Any, any of our side projects, generally don't turn into big businesses unless they start getting the focus like a real main project. Exactly. That's a great point. Yeah. So I want to talk um, about this a little bit interesting, right? Because one of the things we, we talk about is your common enemy and generally in terms of removing things from your client's life that you think hold them back. So I think in terms of your podcast guest um, service, um, a, who would you figure your primary client is? The podcasters or the guests looking for, um, for 
interviews and what's one of the primary problems they they run into that you think if they removed a change that mindset they would get better results for them yeah so i i don't think one is more important than the other i mean effectively what i've created is a platform or or a marketplace i mean ebay wouldn't be ebay without buyers or sellers you know you, you have to have both there and so in in my case that's the the podcasters and the audience uh, and the experts that want to be guests on their show. Now, what helped me get it off the ground is that in a lot of cases, that's the same people. So uh, you're a podcaster, but you probably like to be a guest on other podcasts too. It's a great way to grow your show. So I only had to kind of bring in one group, but it breaks down if I'm not providing value to to both of those groups. And so I think the value in, in your case, having been featured in the newsletter to you is I, I can bring you a lot of uh, a lot of applicants to be on your show that will pitch you directly and easily to be on there rather than you going out and reaching out to all of these people. And then for those experts, it's it's valuable to them to see, okay, here's a podcast that does want guests on it. The, their alternative is to go out and just cold email, cold call a bunch of podcasters who may or may not be looking for for guests for their show. And so one thing I did, one of the challenges that the experts told me they had is that they'll apply to be on a show. And in a lot of in some cases, I don't know how many applications you got, but they can get 50 to 100 applications to be on their show when they're featured in the newsletter. Yeah. And um, the, the challenge there is standing out. And so I had some, some experts that said, look, I, I love what you're doing, but is there any way I can pay something so that I don't have to do all the outreach? And so for that reason, or, or as a result of that feedback, I created kind of a push model for these experts where I have a directory that they can pay a monthly fee to be in. And then podcasters can come looking in there for guests as well. And then I feature some of these experts as well in the newsletter. So they get in front of 15,000 people, many of whom are podcasters and, and can get invited on, on the podcast. So I, I think that the model before to get booked on podcasts, and, and still this is a viable model, it's just expensive, is kind of the agency and the cold outreach model. There, there are lots of services out there, many of them are great, that say, hey, we'll get you booked on five podcasts a month. It's, you know, $600, $1,000 a month to do that. And they do a fine job, but not everyone wants to spend that kind of money, especially when they don't have to, <laughs> when there's a service out there that yeah. will do it, do it for free. Yeah. And it's like, I, I actually, one of my staff members does that. They, they do the reach out and finding stuff for us. So it's certainly something we pay for. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, we, we, uh, we get good results from the podcast thing. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. So, I talk about your uh, your driving force, right? So just like Spider Man fights to save New York, or Batman fights to save Gotham, or Google fights to index all the world's information. What is it that you guys um, fight for at uh, Podcast Guest? You know that that's that's an interesting question. I I think you know I really just I I want people to be successful and and to succeed in their goals, right? So one of the if if you when it comes down to it, we all I think everyone's ultimate goal is to be happy, right? And we accomplish that in many different ways. For many of us, it's doing something that gives us purpose. Uh, hopefully, what you do as a business isn't just to make money. Um, if it is, hopefully that drives happiness somehow. But that's easier said than done. Uh, and so, when I think about a lot of the people that use my service, a lot of them are solopreneurs. They're people that have decided. Uh, or were forced to decide that the corporate world isn't really for them and, and working for a company isn't for them. They want to work for themselves. They want to take control of their own destiny. And so they're an expert in something. And I want to get them in front of as many people as possible that will want to learn about them and learn about what they have to educate and kind of spread, spread their knowledge. And so... You know, I, I think the power of podcasting, which has become immensely popular in the past few years or now, I think on, on Apple Podcasts, close to 800,000 podcasts, and it's a great way for people to do it. And so I want to help them do that. I want to help them achieve their dreams and ultimately lead to, to happiness. And if you wake up every day saying, 
hey, I'm helping people achieve their dreams and be happy, that, that's pretty cool, right? That, that gives you a lot of, uh, a, a lot of um, backing, a lot of support, a lot of um, drive to, to do what you do. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a service like yours has a tremendous ripple effect as well, right? So you don't just directly affect the people who are using your service, but all their listeners and their audience went like that. So you actually, you have a reach beyond your reach, if that makes sense. That's great. And, and I appreciate you saying that because it's not something I always think of, right? And, and it is, you know, you think of, okay, so thousands of people have gotten booked on podcasts through my service. And then how many people have listened to those podcasts who would not have heard that person or learned that tidbit that yeah. maybe even sparked an idea in their head, which then started another business, right? And so uh, that's a great way of looking at it. I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, I love I love businesses that have the uh, the I call it the ripple effect, mm -hmm. right? Where where the uh, the the impact is greater than the uh, than the input, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is I think super cool. So I want to I want to move a little bit and go uh, um, practical on you and talk about what I call the hero's tool belt, right? So maybe you have a big magical hammer like Thor or a bulletproof vest like your neighborhood police officer. What are some of the uh, the tools that you you use to sort of make the business go around? I know you mentioned a few of them early on. You know, was uh, Mailchimp and Google Forms, but what 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 is it? Some of the stuff that like really powers um, podcast guests and makes it do what it does. Yeah, I would say in addition to those tool two tools, you know, I have I, I use WordPress for the website and have uh, some plugins on there that have been uh, I, I hired a developer, this was my bigger investment, was to create kind of this directory on there uh, that, that works in the back end where people can invite people onto their show. You know, WordPress is probably in a lot of people's tool chests. I, I would say on the, on the podcast guest business, I don't have um, a lot of tools that I use and I don't spend a lot of money on those tools. And so WordPress, Google Forms, MailChimp. Very lean business. Yeah, it, it is from a, a tools perspective. Um, I use Stripe as a, uh, a way to collect payments. So that's another thing that I, I use. And then uh, I've grown the business a lot through Facebook and Facebook ads. Uh, so I think that's something that, that people should look into. And then of course, I have a Twitter presence as well there. And I found that even though my, uh, for, for my domain name side, I have like 35,000 Twitter followers and get a lot of traffic from that. My audience on Facebook and Twitter for podcast guests isn't nearly as large, but they're very engaged. And so whenever I feature someone in my newsletter, I also include them on social media. And that, that generates a, a few more inquiries, a few more uh, invites to that person to be a guest on on their podcast uh, a lot of the time. So I think that's helpful as, as well. Um, you know, I would say, yeah, a, a lot of the tools, uh, Gmail is basically free <laughs> depending on how you use it. Um, I, and, and I really do have a lot of tools that when I think about it, I, I use in my business, a lot of applications, but a lot of them are kind of specific to domain name investing. So <laughs> they probably aren't uh, that useful. I would say, I would say to your audience. Um, but it's amazing very, how much you very can niche. do now and how much you can do for, for free. I mean, when I started websites in the late nineties, I mean, a hosting account was 50 or a hundred dollars. A domain name was $70. Then you had to figure out, you know, how to create a website on it. So I used Microsoft front page, which as a college student, Ooh. I could go pick up. I was a pain in the rear end. Go pick up the CD ROMs. Let's, let's, let's remember here, you know, at, at the computer store for like five bucks because they had a student discount. Um, and so nothing was easy back then. Now you can spin up a website with a domain name, with an SSL certificate, an e-commerce store for less than a hundred bucks in a day. You know, it's, it's, it's really amazing what you can do now. <laughs> you can, you <laughs> get it up in five back. minutes if you have your resources put together. Oh yeah. 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 So it's, it's really remarkable what you can do today. And, and I would say if anyone's thinking about starting a business, there's so many tools that make it super simple now and, and they, they bring it all together. Um, GoDaddy has a great, they call it now websites plus marketing um, where it really brings the whole thing to help you create the site <clears throat> and then do the email marketing behind it, do the e-commerce, 
Shopify is a great platform. You have Squarespace, Wix, Weebly, all these things that make it super simple to start a business these days. And that doesn't mean that the moment you turn it on, all of a sudden you're getting customers. You still have to work and figure things out. Uh, but it's so much easier than it used to be and so much less expensive. So I would encourage anyone yeah, who's it, on the sidelines, just take the leap. Get out there and, and do something and see if your passion is really as strong as you think it is. Yeah. It seems like nowadays you can focus on just the important aspects of business, right? Instead of focusing on all the tools and the things and, you know, the uh, proverbial business card that you have to get done. Um, exactly you, right. you, can fo you can focus on the things that really matter, which is finding a market that has a problem and solving it, right? And then getting that message to them, um, <laughs> which is, is really what uh, is going to drive revenue for your business. And that's all you have to focus on. You don't have to figure everything else out. Right. Right. The new show will be right back. Are you tired of trying to write webinars that don't consistently convert? How would you like to have a webinar that effortlessly created sales in your online business? You can. Introducing the Webinar Alchemy Workshop. Webinar Alchemy Workshop is an online masterclass that will help you write incredibly persuasive webinars for your online courses quickly and easily. Using what you learn in this class, you can build a webinar that educates your entire audience while still creating sales. For a limited time, you can purchase this masterclass for only $7, and you'll get the exact framework I've personally used to help my clients sell more than a million dollars worth of online coaching and training just over the last year. Simply text the word ALCHEMY, A-L-C-H-E-M-Y, to 444-999, and I'll send you all the details. The music is by Purple Planet Music. Visit www.purple-planet.com. And now, back to the show. I wanted to talk about your own personal heroes. Frodo, you know, Frodo had his Gandalf, Luke had his Obi-Wan, Robert Kiyosaki had his rich dad. Who were uh, some of your heroes in your entrepreneurial journey? Were they real life mentors? Were they uh, speakers or authors, maybe peers who were a couple of years ahead of you? And how important were they to uh, what you've accomplished so far? You know, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and I know from your previous interviews that, that you asked that. And um, so I, I've given some thought to it and I really struggle with it because there's not like one person that I would say has, you know, driven me to, to, to do what I've done in life. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, yes, my parents were wonderful. My wife is wonderful and, and supportive. Uh, you know, I had some great professors in college, mentors when I worked for other people and such, but there's not one person. And, and, and I think for me, what it's more is that I've had individuals that have influenced a couple years of my life um, and, you know, that have put me in the direction that I've, that I've ultimately gone. Uh, and then I also have a good network of friends who are in a similar situation to me. They run their own business that has been great. So one of the things that I was very fortunate to do starting uh, probably around, gosh, it's been over a decade now, is I got involved with an entrepreneur group. And this is when I lived in Austin. So it was all local entrepreneurs. We're all at different stages of our business. And having a sounding board like that is, is very important. So if, they're, if you're in a situation where you can find people, they don't need to be in the same type of business as you, but just in a similar situation, and it can be very informal at first, but just a group that you can get together with, whether it's once a month, once a week, maybe it's even remote, it's over Skype or, or Zoom, a, a video conference. I think that's been one of the most valuable things that I have done that's really helped me uh, get to where I am. So I wouldn't say it's one individual person, I would say it's having a sounding board, having a group of people uh, that that I could rely on to provide advice, counsel, motivation. Uh, it's it's really hard when you're off on your own to to be motivated sometimes, uh, and those sorts of things have been extremely helpful to me. Um, I found of course, that also, I, I, that, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I said I found that groups like that are also useful for the uh, proverbial ass kicking too. You're like, hey, I'm going to do this, and then they're going to hound you to make sure you do it. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, accountability partners, you know, you can kind of look at it like that, right? Which is someone who every month is, gonna, is going to say, hey, you said you're going to do this. Did you do it? You know, and, and, and like you said, you know, kicking your butt, making sure that you do it. It's, it's very valuable that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I agree. I, you know, I've been, um, I, if I were, someone would ask me that question, who are some of my heroes, the list would be really long, right? It's all the people that have had, you know, a positive influence in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a hard question, but it's, I think it's a useful one to think about just to go back and realize how many people have impacted your life. Um, and some of them in small ways who probably don't even know and realize that you probably have the same impact on other people that you don't even know, which is cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, what I, I want to, I did think about that for like 20, 20 minutes and, and, you know, I, I, I have a lot of friends who are like, yeah, this one person, these two people, they changed the course of my life forever. And, um, I, I don't think I've had that, but you know, I've had a lot of people that have had a big impact on me. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's always, always those people that, uh, that put you on, you know, mm. might nudge you in the right way. Like I'm, I'm fairly certain my, uh, I had a seventh grade teacher who, you know, pulled me aside and helped me with writing a little bit. Um, that probably doesn't even realize that that's, mm. you know, become a major part of my career and trajectory in life. Um, so, you know, it, it's cool stuff that happens like that. So, um, I want to get on to the uh, sort of the last question we get into here, which is your guiding principles. Um, and basically, what are the top one or two principles or actions that you put in practice sort of every day that you think contribute to the success and influence of your couple of brands? Maybe stuff you wish you'd known when you started. Um, you know, I would say guiding principles. One thing, and this is something that I, I, I do credit my parents with, is honesty needs to be something that guides you every day and what you do. And, uh, you know, it seems like there's not so much of that, uh, in, in the world anymore. Um, you know, you, even in business, we've seen some high profile blowups where people weren't as honest with people as they should have been. And so I, I think when, when you're honest with yourself and with other people, it helps you sleep well at night. Uh, it's just one of those things that yeah. if you're, I, I think people can tell when people aren't being honest and even though they can get, get away with it for a while, eventually it comes back to get them. And, you know, you see a lot of people that make a lot of money or who are quote unquote successful, who really aren't honest. And I think most of them get their comeuppance uh, eventually. Um, another thing I'd say is to always accept feedback. And I've used that in my businesses. Feedback, I, I, I treat that as a gift. Even if I, don't necessarily agree with what someone's saying or they aren't saying it in a friendly way. I, I found that feedback is what has driven me to make changes in my business and my approach. And even if it's blunt feedback, in fact, blunt feedback is usually the best. It's good to think about that feedback. And so, so listening feedback is important too. A lot of times people won't tell you what they're thinking unless you ask. Um, and then, you know, I've given a lot of thought recently. I, I, I moved about four months ago, five months ago, uh, uh, across the country from, from Austin to the Seattle area. And, you know, it's kind of been, I'm, I'm 41, so it's kind of, kind of been one of those reset moments where I give a lot of thought to things. And, you know, we're, I mentioned this earlier, but I think we're all trying to be happy. That, that's our end goal in whatever we do. And a lot of us are doing things that don't, make us happy right so you might think that i've been one of those type a people all my life i you know got into a great university program graduated top top of my class there made a lot of money my first job out of school and when you sit back and say okay but why am i doing this oh it's to be happy um is making money going to make me happier at the end of the day or am i stuck in this rat race uh of, of making more money to buy more stuff I think when, when you go through life, you get to these things where you say, oh, well, I'll be happy when this happens. And then that happens and you're happy for 24 or 48 hours. And then, you know, you're, you're back to where you were and you're like, okay, what's my, what's my next goal that'll make me happy? And so I, I've really tried to focus, and this is fairly new for me, but thinking about, okay, will this ultimately make me happy? Uh, there's a great book, um, and I meant to bring it into the office here so that I could just show the cover, but let me do this instead. I'll look it up. I apologize for doing this, um, but so I can give the name. Uh, so it's, it's called Happier. No That's the name of the book. Um, it's, a, it's a Harvard professor pulling this up right now to get his name. Do, do, do. Uh, Tal Bin Shamar, 
Um, yeah. And he's a, he's an educator. He teaches at, at, at Harvard. He's taught about how to be happy. And, and his, you know, he, w- he grew up in Israel and said he wanted to be the squash champion uh, of the country. And he was. And everything he was doing was driving toward this. And then he was happy for like, he was blissfully happy for a day or two after he won. But then he realized that wasn't his everlasting, you know, thing. It wasn't going to bring him happiness. Uh, So he studied a lot about it. Great book. Uh, I highly recommend, um, highly recommend reading it and thinking about what you're doing in your life and your business and personally and how that's driving you toward what your, what your ultimate goals are. Yeah. And I've, I've discovered personally that, uh, for me at least, and I think for a lot of other people, it's generally the, uh, the journey, not the destination that brings the happiness. And even when it comes to like things that you want, Mm -hmm. right. It's the wanting of the thing that's exciting, not the having of the thing. Um, and you know, you you remember that from being a kid, you're like, you really, really want the toy or whatever. And then you finally get the toy and you realize that it's not as fun as wanting the toy was. (laughs) <laughs> um, you know, or it's short lived or anyway. I think that's uh, there's another great book. In business. Yeah. Oops. Go ahead. Oh, looks like we froze for a second, but there's another great book, Happy Money. Um, and it talks about it it talks about actually five, you know, five principles. But one of it is, yeah, the waiting for it's the most exciting part. And so um I I know when we bought our, our Tesla, the most exciting part was the long wait while we were waiting for it to show up, you know, the, the two months, the excitement around it and, and, and that sort of stuff. And so, whereas then once you get it, it, and this goes for any car and you start driving it after a month, it's, it's, it's nothing, you know, that wears it's off. The car. Right? And so chasing things like that. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's just how you get around. Right. So, um, so yeah, I think, uh, I, that book also had a pretty big impact uh, on me, ha- Happy Money. Absolutely. Um, and I, I, I like a lot, of, a lot of those, that kind of thinking. And like, I, I just realized like at, at this point in my life, when I want things, it's like, does this actually give me opportunities to experience things I couldn't experience before? Um, and mm-hmm. then I, like, I have like, those are the only kind of things I have on the list. Because otherwise, I'm like, I just don't care. <laughs> well, and, and, and that's another principle of happy money, which is spend money on experiences, not things. Uh, because those experiences, you'll, you'll remember them a long time from now. Uh, and so they continue to pay dividends. Whereas, you know, your first car you spent money on is long gone, right? <laughs> and so it's providing no enjoyment to you now. Whereas the memories of, of experiences and, and friendships and such are much more valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So um, that basically brings us to the inter- end of our interview. I have one more thing I do on every show. I call it the Hero Challenge. Um, and it, and do you have someone in your network um, who has a really cool entrepreneurial story? Who are they? First names are fine. And why do you think they should come share their story on our show? Ooh, I have so many people that, uh, that I, I love their story. Um, you know, one of them is actually the person who, uh, uh, does the audio for, for my podcast and what I love, and, uh, I don't know how much you talk about your story, but his is kind of similar. He now drives around in an RV exploring the country Nice. Um, doing this from the road, which is very admirable. Uh, uh, Kerry, he, he runs a service called Podcast Fast Track, who um, does, cool. uh, yeah, does does audio editing, and he's got a, a team, and it's it's all remote. Um, so that's one person. When I think about the the, the types of people that are living uh, a good lifestyle, that I I think are are very interesting. Um, I have lots of friends who have been. Uh, very successful. And, uh, you know, but I, I think that's one that jumps to mind that I think is great for for your audience. Awesome. Yeah, I would love to uh, reach out. We'll connect later about uh, connecting with him. Yeah. Um, and last thing here is, you know, just thank you so much for being on the show. And where can people find you? Right. So um, I assume if they're either running a podcast or they want to be featured on podcasts, <clears throat> 
or if they're interested in the domain name space, where can they find you and what should they, uh, what should they do? Who are the ideal people to explore? Yeah, so there, there are a couple things here. One is that, uh, yeah, do go check out podcastguests.com if you're interested. If you either have a podcast and you're trying to find guests or you're interested in being a guest on podcasts, um, I put together a free guide. You don't even have to provide your email address to download it on being a, a guest on podcasts, what, what the value is, how to do it, kind of step by step. And you can get that at podcastguests.com slash guide. And uh, I, I personally respond to all the emails that come in on, on podcastguests.com. I send out a weekly email. And then if you respond to that, I, I personally get that. So that's a great way to connect with me. And then if you're interested in domain names, check out domainnamewire.com. Uh, it's kind of a, a fun little industry. I know a lot of people own domain names for their business. And, and you might learn a thing or two there and, and hopefully get sucked in. Hello. That is the show, and it's just you know personally because I'm curious how uh, how how much has the new top level domains you know all the you know there's like a hundred bajillion of them now how has that affected the industry? So those started rolling out in 2014, and um, their impact's been kind of nominal. So some people are using them, but they haven't taken off like they expected, and so. Um, you know, dot com, at least in the US, is still king by far. People prefer to have that. Um, and so the impact has been fairly minimal. Um, it, it drove a lot of money into the industry for a while, and now it's kind of pulled back uh, because, because they haven't been quite the money maker that people expected. There, there are some successful companies that operate them, and obviously, I'm sure you've seen some of them out there in the wild that are being used. Um, but it just hasn't had that big of an impact on on how people use and think of domain names. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that, um, out of the whole, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them that have cropped up, the ones that seem to be the most popular are like .io and .pro, and maybe you know some of the uh, adult specific ones that uh, that have have popped into being used. But yeah, well, really, it's like culturally, nobody nobody thinks of them as domain names. Yeah, and and dot io and dot pro are actually not part of this new top level domain program. They've actually been out for a long time, right? Which which is um, those two letter domains are country code domains. Like dot co is another one, which is actually from Colombia, um, and so. Um, you know, there were already kind of hundreds of choices that people had. So adding another 800 choices didn't really open up the name space that much. Um, and so uh, it, it's been interesting to watch, though, for sure. I, I, I've obviously yeah. written a lot about it. <laughs> so <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, and I just I, I, I was curious from an industry insider, because like from an, as an outsider, like who buys domains for personal use for businesses or for clients, our recommendation hasn't changed, right? It's, you know, if you can get the .com, get the .com. And, you know, if you're a personal brand, you might use something like .me for, um, you know, occasionally. And maybe if you're an internet organization, you might use IO. But like, like for the vast majority of clients, you know, if you can get the .com, get a .com. Yeah, you know, I, I think, yeah, for the in vast majority of cases, that that's the right advice. Um, I have noticed quite a few people that are using podcast guests will use, like for their show, for their podcast, they might do something that's uh, a little bit different. Uh, you know, there's like, I think there's dot show out there, right? But, uh, you know, there, there are lots of things that you could use for a podcast. And it really depends on, on what, you're, what you're using it for. But yeah, most of the time, try to get the dot yeah. com. Uh, even if you yeah, have to spend had, a couple uh, thousand dollars to buy it from someone else, that's the right advice. I I had the hero show.com and the hero dot show and the hero show.com is just so much easier to roll off the tongue and actually use. Uh, I don't think we currently have that domain, but we did for a while. Um, yeah. Anyways. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. So yeah. Um, guess to finish this off, remind people it was uh, podcastguestcom forward slash guide. If they want to learn about the value of being a podcast guest and what can do for your business. Um, and if they run a podcast and they want to be featured in your newsletter, same place, just podcastguest.com. They have a specific place to go there. Yeah, all you have to do, put put in your email address and your first name and, and you'll be signed up. Every Monday morning, I send out my uh, email that has the list of experts and podcasts and you can click a link and apply on them. As you know, it's super simple. So, um, yeah. and yeah, 
that's what to do. So I really appreciate you having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for being on the show. Really appreciate it. You have any uh, final parting words of wisdom for our, uh, our audience? Uh, yeah, do something, you know, N- 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 Nike's, uh, Nike says, just do it when they think of athletics, but I'd say the same thing when it comes to business, take that next step, uh, to, to do something that's going to, uh, improve your life, improve your business, move it forward. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show, Andrew. Really appreciate it. My pleasure.